Welcome to Green Ball, the Irish Cricket Chat Show. I'm Craig Easdown, and today we're going to look at uh, two milestone matches in Ireland men's cricket history. Uh, to do this, I'm joined by three special guests, each who took a part in these two games. Uh, between these gentlemen, there are 489 international caps for Ireland. So welcome to Kyle McCallan, Andrew White and Roy Torrens. Hi, Craig. Thank you. Hi, Craig. Thank you, Craig. We're going to start with a bit of a get-to-know-you round. Uh, to many Irish cricket fans, you'll be familiar people, but for some out there, they won't know as much about you. So we're going to start with Roy. Um, Roy, many fans of Irish cricket will have a mental image of you as team manager punching the air and celebrating the victory over Pakistan. But some won't know that you made 30 appearances for Ireland between 1965 and 84. You took 77 wickets and a best of seven for 40. But I wrote with interest, Roy, that uh, you were apparently the best paceman to come out of the Northwest until Boyd Rankin. That's high praise. Uh, what do you remember playing for Ireland in the 60s to the 80s? Well, first of all, Craig, it was a completely different experience compared to now. Basically, <clears throat> we were all weekend cricketers. Uh, who played in the four different unions in Ireland. And we only met up three or four times in the year playing interprovincial games. And uh, because of the financial restrictions that Ireland cricket were put under in those days, when we played a game, we were uh, put up, bulleted in uh, people's houses. Uh, we went to Dublin. Uh, I usually stayed with Stan Mitchell. And in fact, I remember a game against Australia when the night before the game, I lay on Stan Mitchell's sofa the night before the game. So it was hardly an equal playing field, Ireland v Australia. <laughs> uh, we received a cap, but uh, you had to buy your own sweater. And when playing abroad, uh, you, you sent your letter of acceptance back to the secretary with a check for the airfare. So you can see how much we have come on since those days. Also, <clears throat> we only played three, three or four games in a season. So although I, my career lasted 18 years, I ended up with 30 caps. I just wonder how many caps I would have had nowadays. Absolutely. Roy, Roy you missed a comment there about one of the best pace men to come out of the Northwest. Is that... That can't be true, can it? Well, I was too, I was too uh, polite to mention myself there. Why do you know? But, uh, yeah, I would have caused you a wee bit of problem when you would have been playing your usual stance uh, nearer the square leg umpire than the stumps. <laughs> I don't know too many fast bowlers who had a 20-year career as well. I'm starting to put a wee bit of doubt in my mind that you're actually that quick at all. Well, I was superbly fit, you see, kind of unlike you, you know, and uh, why they unlike you as well, I never got 8, 9, 10, 11 out. If you look at my victims, they were 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. <laughs> well, I don't know whether Boyd Rang will be happy being used in the same sentence as you now, come on. <laughs> well, he has been on the phone there recently and he told me that uh, it was an honour being mentioned in the same breath as myself. <laughs> Now, Roy, you debuted in 65 and you were from the Northwest. But I'm curious, uh, you didn't actually play in the Simon Mills match against West Indies. What happened there? Well, what actually happened there, Greg, was that in those days, uh, they didn't pick the team until the week before the game. And uh, that game was played in July. And um, Unfortunately, where I worked, everyone had booked their holidays off in July, so I wasn't able to get time off to play in that game. Apparently, you're not just a, you weren't just a fearsome bowler, but you were quite handy with the bat, I believe. Uh, I, read somewhere, I read somewhere you hit 177 in an hour one afternoon in a club match. Is that true? There's a, a charity competition being, uh, it's played every year in the Northwest and uh, there's quite a decent crowd comes out to support it because the organizers give the proceeds lifted at the, at the ground to the local charities. So it's quite a popular competition. And while playing for Brigade, I was draw, uh, we were drawn against a team from uh, Crimble who were second division side in a 20 over game and uh, we won the toss and batted first 
And uh, I was batting three. It shows you just how strong a side that we had. I was batting three. And whenever I was out, the scoreboard read 191 for three. Last man, 177. <laughs> so, yeah, that was in an hour. I didn't do much running. Roy, just finishing there, you had numerous roles. You were a player, you were president of the Irish Cricket Union, you were team manager, but selector as well. And I believe you even selected Andrew and Kyle. Is that, is that right? Good job, Roy. Well, that was the only blemish in my career. <laughs> was that a, a, a give these, these two boys, the fact that I knew their fathers very well didn't, uh, didn't, didn't come in there. But uh, no, I was a selector between 93 and 99. During my selectorial ship, I made, I hope, many good decisions. So I was allowed the odd, the odd dodgy one, you know. So moving on to Kyle. Uh, Kyle, you were for quite a while the most capped Irish cricketer. You finished with 227 caps for Ireland and 54 of those as captain. Um, bit of an all-rounder. You scored over 3,600 runs, hit two centuries and took 256 wickets with the best of five for 23. But what was sporting life for young Kyle McCallum? Was it always cricket you were destined for? Yeah, probably. No, I was I was a bit of a sport billy at school. I just got involved in everything. I played rugby, I played football, basketball, tennis, athletics, did everything. But I uh, went to university and played in the varsity rugby match against Queen's. And it was then when it became apparent that a wee skinny, scrawny boy was never going to be a rugby player. Uh, Jeremy Davison, who was just about to become a British Lion, turned up the train with this one evening and that very quickly focused my attention on cricket. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it was pretty much cricket from the get-go, yeah. Very good. Uh, one anomaly I'm curious about is um, I mentioned you scored two international centuries uh, for Ireland. Um, your highest score is exactly 100, which means twice you made it to three figures and twice you're out on 100. What was going on there? Uh, I'll add to that. On both occasions, I was out the very next ball, actually. Um, <laughs> the first one was, was against the MCC in Malahide. I think it was my second game. And uh, just the excitement of getting... The 100, like I was absolutely overwhelmed by it. And there was a guy bowling very sort of slow, slow left arm, and I just chipped one back to him, next ball. Um, that was a bit of a disappointment. And then, unlike Roy, you know, with his 177 in an hour, I got 100 against Scotland. I think it was, in, it was either in a triple crown or in the European Championships in Paisley. Um, back in those days, I was a, a swashbuckling opening batsman, and I'd got the 100 in the 50th over. Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> happened to get caught on the boundary in the last over, having probably scored 100 off with 160 balls. <laughs> As from memory, I think you were caught on the boundary, the third man of a top edge. Well, Roy, your memory's better than mine. Already straight down the ground, Roy, was it? I, I wouldn't have thought so, no. Hey, that's, that's rich coming from you, Wade. <laughs> Andrew, uh, you debuted for Ireland a few years after Kyle. You made 232 caps, scoring over 4,500 runs, with a high score of 152 not out, and took 125 wickets at 27. Um, but I believe your official debut was a bit delayed. Yeah, I was selected for the Triple Crown in 2000, and uh, it had been a very wet week, um, and all three games were, were washed out and ended up in a bowl out. Um, Subsequently, then they were they weren't capped games, and so I had to wait to the opening game of the European Championships in Scotland that summer uh, from a from a debut. Um, but equally very proud um, to do that. Now, when you did actually debut, Kyle was not only your captain, but in fact the two of you were openers that day. So, how was that as an opening partnership? Yeah, it was great. I suppose from my point of view, it was it was all quite strange because whilst I knew Kyle and the likes of Andy Patterson uh, being from the NCU, you know, I actually didn't know some of the guys in the squad that well. The likes of you know Matt Dwyer, Gordy Cook, Angus Dunlop, Peter Gillespie. I'd played maybe played once or twice against them, but didn't really know them. Um, but they were brilliant with me, and uh, you know, so from Kyle's point of view, it was great to have a familiar face at the other end. Don Joyce, I think, batted, maybe batted three in the game. Um, and we'd come through the, the youth setup together, obviously. So that was, that was nice. I think we made our debut the same day. Don Joyce wouldn't have had too long to wait to come in the bat then, Whitey. 
<laughs> well, it was one of the two of us, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, Andrew, you, de- you debuted at 20 years of age. Uh, you took a fall for in your second match and a century, hit a century in your third. So it was a step up the international career to come to one for you? No, it sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? But uh, <laughs> I think um, well, when you're young and, and you, you, know, you just carry on doing what you've been doing, uh, there's no baggage there. And um, Sometimes what you find is that when young players come into the side, they do quite well initially, and it's only slightly further down the line that you come up against the, you know, the talk about first season or second season syndrome, even whenever players struggle uh, once opposition get to know them and, and stuff like that there. But I was sort of riding the crest of a wave, really, in terms of really enjoying cricket and enjoying being part of the, the team. And, um, yeah, it, it went, certainly went very well at the start. I think Roy stood and clapped that 100 as well. I always remember that. Some still act there, me. Why they wasn't it? And you picked me and him to open the bat, and you can't have been that good. <laughs> I know. Hey, hey, I was looking at the two he's gone out to open, and I thought to myself, Jesus, I retired too soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to move to a quick fire question round now. Quick questions and quick answers. Um, we'll start with. What's your favourite Irish ground to play at? I have to say probably Eglinton on a sunny day. I'm going to be biased. The lawn, Warringstown. I would have to say Clon Tarf, although it was a challenge for a pace bowler, but the people were lovely. The ground was very attractive and Mrs McDermott had marvellous food. Well, these not very quick answers right now. <laughs> The clues, the clues in the title, Roy. Right? Quick fire round. <laughs> um, which Irish match or performance for Ireland were you most proud of? Uh, easy to look at the big wins, but uh, probably one that flies on the radar is the Intercontinental Cup final win in Windhoek against Kenya in 2004, was it? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just going to plump for the easy one, the one that's behind you there, Craig. Pakistan, Savannah Park. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Simple. Yeah, I would have to go along with Ken. Pakistan, March 2007 World Cup, because I reckon that uh, Ireland arrived on the big stage on that day. Finish this sentence. If I wasn't a cricketer, I would be a... Golfer? Wouldn't, it ma- wouldn't matter whether it was good or bad. Teacher. These two boys are looking as usual for the soft jobs. I would like to be an airline pilot. For those of those who have flown with me, they would they would understand why. I have to say, if I get on a plane and this was Captain Torrance speaking, I'd be first off. I have to tell you. <laughs> um, which Irish player you played with did you most admire? Um. Angus Dunlop was, was the, the, the guy that was probably most senior whenever I went into the side. And he always he, he, he pulled me aside after the first game and said, it's one thing playing for Ireland, but it's not a thing winning. Dermot Monteith. He was the person who started to give the players self-belief. No longer were we just turning up to be the fodder for the opposition. Dermot hated losing. And he transferred the mindset of the players into believing that we were as good as the opposition. Very good. I'm going to throw a different one in, believe it or not. Steve Waugh. Uh, I, I played on an Irish side where Steve Waugh was guested um, against Australia A. And he was just an, you know, him and Hansi Cronje were both just incredible influences and brought a very different perception into the change room with them. Kyle always was a name dropper, wasn't he, Whitey? <laughs> um, which opposition bowler did you fear face most? No, uh, um, you know what? Uh, fear certainly, probably Sean Tate, Brett Lee, but you know, to 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 play against the likes of Muir, Lathan, and Warren was was something special as well. Anybody who bowled over 60 miles an hour? Can't argue. 
Yeah, look, I still remember taking my guard at the Kensington Oval uh, about the face Sean Tate and looking back, I could hardly see Adam Gilchrist. So that, that <laughs> really dried the saliva in the mouth, I can tell you. Yeah. What about when you're bowling? Who was the hardest opposition batter to dislodge? Yeah, one player we, we struggled with over the years would have been Steve Ticklow from Kenya. He was an outstanding player. Um, Brilliant player for, for Kenya um, and, and one that we as a, as a team often struggled with. Yeah, uh, flip. Hard to stop this. I struggled at the slows most of them, to be honest. Um, I was thinking Mike, Mike Hussey played for Australia A against us as well. And boy, he got hundreds for fun the entire series. It was like buns from a bear. Gordon Greenwich. I remember that... Uh, Ralph Mines running up to bowl to him and not knowing where to try and put the ball. If you dropped it short, he hooked you out of the ground. If you threw it full, it drove you straight out of the ground. So basically, the question that I was trying to answer by running up to bowl is, where do I want to try and go and retrieve the ball from? About the most memorable match for Ireland you've ever seen or participated in? Yeah, I'm going to go for that first morning at Lords uh, last summer, Craig. Um, surreal, really. Uh, you know, even before a ball was bowled, but when the Irish boys, Tim Murdoch was going through the English order, it was simply outstanding. And to be in the monks, the, the midst of the English hierarchy at the time, it was uh, quite a pleasant experience now. Uh, I've been pretty fortunate to work with Sky Sports um, since I retired. It's a lot easier sitting on that side of the camera, I can assure you. But I had the great pleasure in 2011 of being in the studio with David Gar, Michael Vaughan and the late, great Bob Willis whenever Ireland were about 120 for five, chasing 300. And there's a little bit of come on Ireland, at least fill in some of the time here. And then as Kevin O'Brien started to feast on the England bowling, they became a little bit twitchy. Uh, and as uh, being in that studio when those win when John Mooney hit those winning runs was as good as an experience as I've ever, I've ever had. It was magnificent. Uh, it would have to be the game against Pakistan. We didn't realise out in the West Indies just how big a reaction that created back home. And uh, the Irish post office had offered free delivery to anybody who wanted to send congratulations to the team. And as the manager, I received 3,000 letters and cards from people in Ireland, from Cork to Coleraine and from Dublin to Donegal. And as I say, being out in the West Indies, we didn't realise just how the people of Ireland enjoyed and, uh, and supported us from Ireland. Bearing in mind that when we went out to the World Cup, I would suggest half of Ireland didn't know they had a cricket team. So that game, in my mind, put us on the world stage. And cricket has never been the same since in Ireland. Very good. OK, we're going to move on to the first match we're going to look at. Uh, and that's the 2006 match. Uh, it's Ireland men's first official one-day international. So just setting the scene, um, it was stormant in Belfast. It was a nice day. The crowd numbered about 7,000. Uh, England had a strong side led by Andrew Strauss and the Irish side would not long afterwards achieve global superstardom as Roy talked about at the 2007 World Cup. But before we get into the match itself, let's talk about the build-up. Um, Roy, you were team manager at that time. How did you find yourself to become team manager of the Ireland men's team? Well... I had uh, been selector in the late 90s, chairman of selector and president in the year 2000. And uh, I was approached by the Irish secretary at the time, John Wright, and asked if I would uh, undertake the manager's job. Up until then, that had been fairly ad hoc. There were different people who had, had taken on the job for a short space of time. But John asked me, he pointed out that uh, we were now members of the uh, Cricket Association and that uh, we would be expected to play 
a few games around the world and whatnot. But he did say, when I asked about commitment, he said about four or five games a season. Uh, I said, well, I could manage that okay. Uh, 12 years later and 376 games later, I retired. I had been around the world twice, which leads me to believe we John Wright was a political family. Never believe a politician. Carl, um, in the lead up to this, in the lead up to this match, uh, the island side had paid three English county sides, Middlesex, Kent, and Sussex, for three losses. But this was Ireland's first official ODI. Was there a sense of excitement and anticipation building up around the match? Yeah, huge. You know, the opportunity to play England at Stormont in front of a full house was always creating a huge amount of excitement. And the difficulty with the three lead-up games, playing in the old days, whether it had been the Benson and Hedges or the Cheltenham and Gloucester or the Friends Provident or whatever it was it was ever called, you know, we were at such a significant disadvantage in comparison to the counties because very often we were without our county contracted players. Um, and, you know, we... we we were coming up against sides like Hampshire, who had Stuart Clark, Shane Warren, you know, highly paid overseas, world class players. On top of that, so it was a, we always viewed the, those those games as just a real learning experience. I mean, you know, we went to Middlesex and Ed Joyce was playing against us. Um, Kent, I think it was part of their festival week, you know. So you had Nala Brand keeping wicket for them with Martin Van Yarsvale, Justin Kemp, and all their South Africans playing. And then obviously we had Sussex at Clontarf and we, we give a pretty good account of ourselves there. Um, so, you know, we never looked too much at results in the build-up to the, to the England game, um, but we were hugely excited at the prospect of, of England. I think just coming off, you know, the, the famous 2005 Ashes win, you know, coming to Belfast and, you know, it was hugely exciting. Um, Andrew, you had the honour of handing out the test caps to the 11 players making their test debut for Ireland at Malahide in 2018. But you're actually one of the 11 players making your official one-day international debut in 2006. Was there a feeling on the morning of a momentous occasion? Was there a cap presentation ceremony? No, there, there wasn't. But I suppose, um, yeah, it was a hugely significant stepping stone for Irish cricket getting one-day international status. Obviously, we played a lot of one-day games uh, internationals against you know, we played the West Indies 2004 at Stornham and beaten them. But uh, no, it was it was very much down to business. Um, you know, Eddie Burrell was a coach at the time, and you know, it was a case of get out there and do your job. And um, you know, we we thrived on the occasion. So, Roy, getting on to game day itself. So, what was the role of a team manager on game day back then? Were you tracksuit on, helping with the warm ups? Did you interact with the players before and during the game? No, no. Uh, on, on the days when we played the World Cup games, it was, uh, it was quite busy, actually. And it started... What, what you have to bear in mind is when we were playing the World Cup in countries like uh, West Indies and uh, Australia, uh, the game started at around 9.30 in the morning. So uh, first thing I had to do was make sure these guys got up out of their bed and come down and had a proper breakfast. That, that would have been approximately around six in the morning. Uh, once we arrived at the stadium, uh, the players got changed and uh, we got into a huddle and normally then the team was announced. So uh, I had to uh, fill in the team sheets and make sure all was in order for the captains to uh, exchange them at the toss. While the players were doing their warm-up, uh, I then attended meetings with the managers, umpires, and the match managers to discuss the day's arrangements, the meal times, uh, what actual food was going to be offered, make sure our boys could uh, eat it. Although, these two characters usually have their own and quite a lot of other food as well. And uh, also make sure that uh, if there are any national anthems, that they were playing the right tunes. And if there are any dignitaries, we had to organize a lineup uh, for the dignitaries uh, to meet the players. Uh, also had to make sure because um, people were some people reacted differently before the match. Some were excited, some were quiet, and you had to go around and make sure that each player was happy 
And uh, after uh, the game, of course, once we had identified those for drug testing, uh, we had to take them along and have that performed. And uh, usually at the press conference after, it was normally the captain, but every now and then if someone had excelled during the game, they were invited along as well. And finally, liaised with the transport and security again uh, to have the bus um, to take us back to the hotel. So on, on match day, while these boys were getting ready to play cricket, I'm not sure they quite they quite realised the amount of work that was going on behind the doors, you know. I was going to say, I, I don't ever remember you doing that amount of work as manager, boy. <laughs> well, there you are, you see, you didn't see it, but there you are, that's what had to be done. <coughs> You made it look very easy, Roy. Thank you, Wally. I wish you could say the same about your baton. <laughs> Back to Stormont. Um, Kyle, there's a bit of a quirky set of circumstances that day. Um, if I've got this right, um, Owen Morgan stepped out of the Irish squad as he was required by Middlesex to cover for Ed Joyce, who was making his debut for England. Um, how did it feel to play Ed that day? I suppose... We were, we were we were used to it, Craig. Um, you know, disappointing as it was that we lost, you know, Owen Morgan, who obviously, you know, everybody in the world knows the impact he's had on the game. Um, you know, so obviously we it was a double whammy. You know, we also we had we had one of Ireland's best ever batters now playing against us, and arguably, you know, one of the best captains and one of the best one day batsmen of all time withdrawn from our squad. But we had been used to it, you know. I'd said to you previously, you know, we played against Ed for Middlesex, we played against Nobby for Kent, and so look, we just we just got on with it, you know. It was somebody else's opportunity, but it was always one of those things. It was you know, Ed will not thank me for saying it, but he didn't really did he did he hammer us too much at any stage, you know. He obviously left a straight one off Boyd in the West Indies, and I think he he, he pulled Lanky the the, the the square leg. So we'll 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 remain joy, joy of that. <laughs> We'll take her. I do recall that Middlesex game at Lords. He, he smashes our in the ground, by the way, but sure, we'll, we'll ignore that fact. Um, and Andrew, on the day we saw Marcus Trescothic saw a century, and um, Ian Bell made a decent 80. But um, if you look at the scorecard and take out that roughly 200 runs, the scorecard could look quite ordinary. Um, did you feel England got away a little to make 301, or was it we, we were all pleased with the bowling effort? I think when, when Marcus Ruscothic scores pretty much a, a run of ball, 113 or 115, you know, when Ian Bell gets, gets 80, there's always going to be others that are going to chip in and, and make a contribution. Significantly, I suppose, uh, Garen Jones and uh, I was going to say Ian Chappell, um, Glenn Chappell of Lancashire, um, scored quickly at the end. They might only have got 13 or 20, but... Um, that propelled them up to 300, which, truth be told, was probably a par score. You know, we chased 297, I think it was, against the West Indies a couple of years previous. And now 300 for us, you know, was it was, it was a big score at that stage of our development. But, you know, I don't think the 300 was not, uh, was not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, and, no, we stuck to our task very well. You know, obviously, Triscothic and Bell have... Outstanding international careers, and they proved how good they were that day. And Carl, three hundred and two was the target. Um, Ireland made its way to one hundred and eighteen for two. You were at the crease. Was that, no, there's a story behind that, Craig. Now I think, obviously, as I alluded to previously, I would have been known for my, you know, my swashbuckling, free-scoring batting. Um, so <laughs> chasing chasing three hundred, Eddie Burrell clearly felt I was the man to keep us up with the rate. <laughs> um, <laughs> truth be told, I, I vividly remember Eddie coming to me in the nets a day or two before the game and saying, look, I think you're playing well. How do you feel about batting four? Now, to be, now, to be honest, having started as an opening batsman and, and, and meandered my way down the order, uh, any opportunity to bat up the order, I grasped with t- two hands. Uh, sitting in the tent when, when Harmison bowled his first over at 96 mile an hour, I was starting to regret my decision, to be honest. But uh, yeah, yeah, look, truth is, we were 118 for two. And, um, you know, when I got out, we lost four for 15. So I'll let you read into that, whatever you think. <laughs> so, 
You took the shine off the ball anyway, Kyle. Thanks for that. Job done. That was my job. Just to just to take the shine off the ball. Yeah, look at at that stage, you know, we were going well. They had a good boat. They were a very, very strong side. Um, and they had seen bowling depth. You had Liam Plunkett at that stage, who was early in his career. You had Harmison, who bowled very, very quickly. Um, and Saj Mahmood. And, and then, obviously, you know, I think they, I think they bowled some real pace bowlers towards the end as well. Ian Bell, um, Jamie Dalrymple, and so on, all come into the attack. You know, once I got out, to be honest, so I wasn't bitter about that in the slightest. But, <laughs> Look, the, the truth, truth of the matter is, it was a great opportunity. To go out. It's, a, it's a win-win. You know, at the end of the day, if you get out for nothing, people would probably just say, well, you know, look who you're facing. And then if you get, if you get run, people say, you know, so for me, it was just a, an opportunity, a win-win situation. I think I got a pretty sedate 20-odd or 40 balls. But um, I think we got, we got close enough. We got close enough. Yeah, look, like Andrew, there was indeed a lower order fight there. And from 134 for six, the last four wickets almost doubled the Irish title, in fact. Your 40 from 42 is certainly central to that. Um, but we'll play some video of um, you and Andrew, uh, you and Kyle playing some reverse sweeps here. So there's a bit of creativity there. Um, what, was, what was the game plan those last, last 20 overs? Was it um, tick the board over, hit out? Was there belief there? I suppose, you know, having lost those, those wickets in the middle, it was a case of trying to, to rebuild site. There were still plenty of overs left. Um, Kevy came in the bat, or Kevy was back. I can't just remember. Kevy was it was only his second or third game, probably second actually. Because I think he made his debut against Sussex, um, the weekend previous. And um, so I suppose there's a wee bit of me trying to talk him through the early stages, and and you know, but he he, he looked at home uh, as he has done throughout his career, and um, yeah, it was just a case of trying to to build something again towards the latter stages. So in the end, it was a 38-run um, defeat, but a lot of pride and confidence came from the game, a lot of respect for Irish cricket. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to venture forward 277 days. And um, just to set the scene, uh, we're now a long way from Stormont. It's St. Patrick's Day 2007. Um, the Irish side just came up, uh, we're coming up against Pakistan at the World Cup. You just uh, tied the first match against Zimbabwe. So... Roy, I just want to start with you. Um, we've heard some comments that the side was delighted to wake up on the 17th of March and see a green top to play on. Um, had the Ireland team manager had a word with the groundskeeper or was it a delightful surprise? No, but, uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, it would have been in the West Indies' favour if Ireland could have uh, set the apple cart and beaten Pakistan. And uh, the West Indies have been to Ireland on a few occasions to play. So they knew the type of wicket that we were being used to playing on in Ireland. And, you know, they probably thought to themselves, well, I, I will give the Irish team as much advantage as we possibly can. And uh, when we turned up the, at the ground, we thought we were in Cliftonville or uh, Cumber. And uh, we, uh, we were amazed and delighted to see how much grass was still left on the wicket. And this is what we had been used playing in back home in Ireland. The Pakistan, on the other hand, were very dubious when they, when they saw this and it was evident when they were doing their warm-ups and, uh, and whatnot that uh, their whole body language wasn't, wasn't good. Um, and especially when Trent won the toss and decided to put them in, we knew they were very unhappy. And uh, this was one of the reasons why, in my opinion, they performed the way that they did. But, uh, you know, let's not detract from the boys' performance on that day. We had all worked very hard in the two previous days to uh, improve our fielding. Which, and, and we were described during that World Cup as one of the best fielding sides in the World Cup. And we had spent two days working hard on that before that game. And I mean, some of the catches that were taken were outstanding. I can think of Big Trent running backwards and diving in one-handed catch. And uh, that was backed up, of course, by some great ball. And I mean, Andre both have bowled magnificently that day. And I think to this day, he has had the second best bowling analysis 
in 50 over World Cup. Only second, I might add, to a uh, one Phil Simmons. So, uh, you know, I think uh, fair, fair, fair play to the boys. Um, Pakistan got off to a bad start, and we never let them off the hook. That that was, I mean, that was a real fantastic performance, and of course, everyone knew about Trent's uh, Churchillian speech in the dressing room before the boys went out. And uh, Nobby, you know, not maybe not a lot of people realise, but Nobby batted magnificently that day for Aaron and uh, scored more than half the runs himself, you know. Previous visit to um, Jamaica, uh, I had uh, I had gone to Ochus Reyes and uh, made contact with the manager S of the Supporters Hotel. So um, she then, now we're talking two months before the game, she invited the, the entire party up to her hotel for St. Patrick's Night, and that's where we had our celebration after the game. Um, Kyle, how did it feel walking off the ground at the halfway stage, having bowled Pakistan out for 132? What was the feeling like in the squad? I get that. Like, obviously, it was, we were elated. Um, the realization that we were so close probably ramped the pressure up significantly. Um, now, obviously, everyone knows about Trent's speech. You know, did you want to go back to being a school teacher? Do you want to go back to being a postman? That'll go down in history. But, you know, I know Eddie was extremely nervous. You know, you can see straight away, you know, he was telling everyone, just calm, just relax, get food on, just chill. But he stayed in the changing room pretty much throughout our innings because I think he was aware of his nervousness and how that might then project onto us and there was no doubt that yeah we were anxious you know because it was like anything the closer you get to such a major win that it's almost harder to get over the line and we were going quite nicely Nobby played just out, out of this world we'd obviously had it you know Andre Bose's decision was just beyond outrageous and then we had a little wobble um you know why do you get out I got out very quickly one ball later let's just say and then Kelly, you know, the, the great strength of this Ari side was the fact that we batted virtually the whole way down. And so, it knows, you know, we still, all the time, whilst I was very nervous at the time, still felt we would always get over the line. But boy, when Trent hit that ball over deep mid-wicket, the, the elation, I don't think I've ever felt a feeling like that in cricket. Yeah, that's, that's actually a great segue, actually, that point there, because we're going to watch some footage, and it always amuses me, um, when Trent Johnson, Andrew, you weren't batting when Trent Johnson hit those winning runs. But if the TV picture sequencing is correct, you had sprinted out and jumped up on him before he'd left the pitch. Where, oh, right. were, where were you I when you were... Uh... Too much stumps before that as well. I think you'd probably grab too much stumps and then jumped on the pitch. <laughs> where were you and how did you get out there so quickly? You know what? It was, it was horrific watching, I have to say. Um, as kind of little too, the two of us didn't spend too much time out in the middle um, in the batting effort. But at the top of the steps, and I, I don't remember much about it, but clearly I must have cleared about 12 steps at a time because there was quite a, quite a number to get down onto the pitch. But yeah, sheer elation. And uh, it was just a relief of getting over the line because it was one of those occasions you, you knew you weren't going to get another chance at it. And uh, as Kyle said, the closer it got, the harder it got. And uh, yeah, certainly glad to see that ball. I don't even remember seeing the ball. I just remember seeing Trent connect, and I knew that was it. Now, Roy, just to finish off on this match, uh, we've discussed the role of the team manager, the responsible role you play. Uh, that, that that night after the win, um, did you play the responsible aloof team manager, or were you right there in the middle of celebrations? I was thinking that manageress of the hotel and not just race would have regretted that decision to invite all the boys up their hotel for the evening. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure about that, but uh, uh, in the dressing room, uh, there was security at the door and no one could get in and out of our dressing room unless I signed a chitty to allow them in. And there were all sorts of people wanting to come in, ambassadors, British ambassadors, Irish ambassadors, and whatnot, people we, we never knew existed. So, uh, But I knew that the manager of the hotel two months prior had invited us all up for the evening. So it was important that we fulfilled that. 
and uh, we and we had a two-hour drive then uh, to the hotel in Notches Race. Now it didn't seem like two hours because uh, we had loads of uh, cans of beer and drink and whatnot on board, and we sung every song that everyone knew on the way. I can remember well when we arrived at the hotel in Notches Race, there must be three or four hundred Irish supporters waiting in the foyer uh, for us. Um, now just to wrap up today's session, um, we've discussed two great milestone matches for the Ireland men's team, but I'm interested in knowing how each of you reflect upon that period in time and how it, uh, how it connects to where Irish cricket is today. Um, Andrew, can I start with you? I suppose look, looking back, um, there was a lot of there was a lot of fun involved um, because we were we, largely we were amateurs, um, you know, taking on the world's best, and we thrived in that environment whereby we were backs against the wall more often than not. Um, we had a superb coach in Eddie Burrell, followed then by by Phil Simmons, obviously, and. Um, the two of them were, were were born winners, and you know what they contributed along the way was huge, um, beyond words really. And I think more than most, the players really enjoyed playing for the two coaches. And, and when you have that environment, then you know great things are possible. And I suppose you know personally, it's it's been a joy to to be part of the journey. And as I mentioned earlier, to be at Lords. Uh, last last year, people asked me, you know, would you love to have been playing? It really didn't matter that I wasn't playing. I didn't really see it as that. You know, my time and other players' times had come and gone, and but everybody felt proud that they played a part in in seeing the team develop along the way. And uh, to watch, I was fortunate enough to be in the long room as 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 William brought the, the players through. At Lords last summer, and it was uh, it was a pinch yourself moment, and it was uh, you know incredible to, incredible to be there and, and witness what unfolded in that first morning. It's just uh, I think lunch on that first morning or that lunch came at the wrong time for us because we lost a couple of wickets after lunch, didn't we? And sort of lost the momentum, but um, you know it was it was incredible to, to be there, and you know as I say, just proud to have been a small part along the way. Nicole, what about yourself? How do you reflect on that period and how it connects to today? I think I don't want to do a disservice or be disrespectful to those who went before, um, but I do think that you know Pakistan in twenty seventeen or twenty seven two thousand seven sorry was the seat you know watershed in terms of Irish cricket. Um, you know, I remember conversations with Roy when things in Toronto in two thousand and one went so badly. We feared actually just for the very future of the game. Um, because everything had so much hinging on it. One of the things that really aggravated me all the time is when we were referred to as minnows and associates, and we've managed to cast that off in, in a lot of ways. But, you know, John Mooney's famous saying was, you know, you may be bigger than us, but our heart's bigger than yours. And that was the greatest strength of our side. We, we had an eclectic bunch. You know, we had lots of different types of characters. Uh, we laughed and cried. We fought. We made up. But when we pulled on that Irish jersey, we would have done anything. To get to get the very best out of each other, and you know that that culture was was central to the Irish you know Irish cricket's development in all those years. And just like Whitey, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to commentate and to watch and analyze some just outrageous achievements. And when you actually look at it, what what we have achieved as a cricketing nation is just nothing sort of, you know short of astonishing. It's just a shame that the, the the likes of John Wright and Derek Scott and some of the greats weren't weren't around to, 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 to see it. You know, that that that's that's one thing. When you see what what they did in their in their term, they 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 planted this the, the, the little seeds out of which the great oak has grown. Very good. No, definitely standing on the shoulders of giants. Um and Roy, from your from your debut, it's been fifty five years since you've been first involved officially with Irish cricket international level. How do you reflect on that period and where we are today? Well, obviously, I mean, we've come such a long way and uh, it, uh, there were individuals along the pathway. I mentioned earlier Dermot Monteith, who, uh, you know, Dermot didn't turn up. He, he didn't play friendly games. He didn't play exhibition games. And uh, 
he transformed the mindset of the Irish team during the 60s and 70s. Obviously, then we've, we've had full time coaches. And uh, I, I, when, when Mike Hendrick was appointed in the mid 90s and uh, he was given the task of getting us to the World Cup, Mike, Mike was a very genuine guy and a real professional. And uh, when he came and he saw the state of Irish cricket, to be honest, I mean, we weren't organised at all. We were little better than uh, uh, average weekend cricketers. But uh, Mike, in my opinion, laid the, the, the railway track down and then uh, the further coaches such as Amy Burrell took the train down the track. But uh, Mike had done a lot of the, the groundwork in trying to instill a more professional approach. By the time we got to Eddie Burrell then, um, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie instilled uh, confidence into the team. And uh, it, it also, uh, when we had the four or five, as I call them, non-Irish players, Coming into the setup, Trent Johnson, Andre Botha, Lanky, Jeremy Bray. These guys came from a different cricketing background than what we were in Ireland. And they instilled a more professional, hardened attitude into the team. And uh, as I say, for the next 10 years, we went from no or very little people in Ireland knew they had a cricket team. And suddenly, uh, because of the progress that we had made and uh, we we were on the world stage and uh, you know the cricketing public of Ireland I think found it hard to understand why we weren't a successful team in 2018 that we were in 2008 but you have to bear in mind that in 2007 2008 we were playing teams like Denmark Israel and Italy and teams like that. We don't play teams like that now. So for a while, obviously, the transition is now we've been thrown into the pool with the big boys. It's a learning curve. Having seen the Irish team in the past year or two, I'm confident that we have the basis now to provide a good Irish side for the next 10 years. And uh, but the Irish cricket public, they will have to remember that, as I say, you know, we're now playing Australia, we're playing England, we're playing the, the South Africa, and it's a learning curve. But I would be confident that, uh, apart from Whitey, who's the chairman of selectors, everybody else is in, is is where they should be, and uh, the team. I see a lot of potential in the team now. And I think the future is great for Irish cricket. That's fantastic. And a fantastic place to finish. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. We could talk for ages, but we'll wrap it up there. And um, thank you all for a great fun chat. Um, thank you, Andrew. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Pleasure, Craig. And thank you, Roy. Pleasure, boys. And don't forget the 20th of July, the Port Hotel is open for business again. <laughs> I'm still trying to come to terms here at 177 in an hour, right? <laughs> uh, hey, and Whitey, I played a maiden back. <laughs> oh, dear. Very good. This has been Green Ball, the Irish Cricket Show, and farewell for now. Thank you. Historic pictures. Ireland had beaten Pakistan and beaten them out of this World Cup. You can see what that means to the team, the management, everyone. Go!